Hi everybody and welcome to our next lecture on marine ecology. So ecology is one of my absolute favorite subjects in the world. I really hope you guys are going to enjoy it. And it's going to be something that we're going to be talking about throughout the entire semester because ecology is the interaction of living organisms and therefore not only living organisms with each other, sorry, of organisms. So not only living organisms with each other but organisms reacting to their environment. So it's all sorts of different kinds of interactions between other organisms and their environment and just everything. So it's interactions, which I think is so fascinating. So without further ado, let's go ahead and just get started with um, marine ecology. Okay, so we're going to be focusing on, like I said, ecology, which is the study of interactions between organisms. So not only other organisms, but their environment as well. So the water, the rocks, the sunlight, everything, right? What are they taking in? What are they putting out? All of these are interactions, and so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. These interactions actually affect the survivalship of any organism. So if you're interacting with someone who's your predator and going to eat you, that's going to affect your survivability. If you're interacting with the sunlight, or say maybe not interacting with the sunlight and you need sunlight to survive, that's an interaction and that's going to affect your survivability. So again, all of these things are basically just determining whether or not you're going to survive or not. Um, so that's what we're focusing on. And again, they really interact in so many different and complex ways, which again is just so fascinating to me. So that's what we're going to be, again, diving into. Get it? Diving, scuba diving joke? Uh -huh. I'm feeling funny today. But like I said, it's because it's my favorite subject. So let's go on and talk about ecology. Now, when we're talking about ecology, we're talking about the interactions of organisms. So we have to define what we mean by organisms. So that remember, a community is just a group of similar organisms living in that area. But, well, that's a population. If you're talking about, they say, let's talk the intertidal. We're in the intertidal, we're at La Jolla, um, we're at, um, I don't know, we're at some rocky intertidal, we're off Point Magoo, something like that. And we're going to go and we're going to go look at the rock. So if you're talking about the barnacles, just that specific one type of barnacle on the rock, you're talking about a population. If you're including the barnacles and the snails and the crabs and the fishes, now you're talking about a community. So usually when we're talking about interactions, we're talking about all the interactions that are going on in a community. Um, that would be community ecology, which is super cool because it's how every little thing is connected to every other little thing. Ah, it's just so cool. Now, when you're talking about a habitat, you're talking about the physical place where the organism lives. That barnacle's habitat is on that rock, right? At Point Magoo, on that rock, is that habitat. Now, when we're specifically talking about a niche, we're talking about all of the things that the organism needs to survive. Not only the habitat, but the food and the temperature and everything that needs to be right for this organism to actually make it and to survive. So that barnacle, if it, say, settles on a rock that's in the Arctic, it's going to be too cold for the barnacle. The barnacle's not going to be able to survive. If it settles in the tropics, there's not going to be enough food for the organism. It's not going to survive. So again, all of these things, so when we're talking about an ecological niche, we're basically talking about the requirements that the organism needs to survive. Where does it need to live? What kind of food? What kind of temperature? What kind of salinity? What kind of all these different factors are going to affect the survivability of this organism? Now, when we're talking about a population, remember we're talking about one species. We're not talking about the community. Lots of them, we're talking about one single species. So this is where this definition really kind of comes into point. You have to know what a population is. Okay, so these populations need specific things. If we're talking about these barnacles, all barnacles live on rocks, including all of the barnacles in this area. So everybody's going to be competing for that rock. That rock is something very important to this organism to survive. If we're talking about the, um, you know, if we're still talking about the barnacle, food, right? It needs wave action. It needs food to come actually to it because, remember, they're stuck on the rocks. Um, so these are also things that are needed for each and every barnacle to survive. Now, this is where it kind of gets interesting because we're actually talking about some parts of competition. If everybody needs food and everybody's going for the same food source, that's where you get competition. Okay, so this is known as a limiting resource, right? If we're, again, on that rock with that barnacle, the rock is only so big, which means there's only so much space. And if every single barnacle needs to be on that rock, 
and it's only this big, you can only fit a certain amount on that rock, which means that rock is a limiting factor. Okay, so space, limiting factor. Things like nutrients, right? If you're in, a, you know, if you're an algae, you need to do photosynthesis, you need nutrients. We need nutrients, we need to absorb certain stuff, right? If you're a marine animal, we don't absorb because we're not in the water. Uh, light, if you're especially photosynthetic like these algaes, you absolutely need light, and that can be a limiting resource. If you're a little algae over here and this bigger, faster growing algae shades you, now you don't have any light, limiting resource. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, inorganic molecules, all of these things, if they're only found in limited quantities and everyone there needs them, that's what's called a limiting factor. And when I say everybody, I'm talking specifically just populations. Because usually the barnacle is going to need something slightly different than the crab, which is going to need slightly different than the algae. Right? They all have their own limiting factors, but it really depends on the species, depending on what your limiting factor is. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. All right, so limiting, when I say limiting factors, limiting resources is basically the exact same thing. Okay, now here's where it actually affects said population size. Now, even if we had all of the things a specific organism needs, like we're talking one little happy barnacle, and he's got space, and he's got food, and he's super happy, great for him. But for the whole population, it's not always the same, it's not always the same case. So even if everybody on that rock still has, you know, what they need, the population can't be sustained infinitely. Meaning you can't just reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and expect all of these resources to still be there. They're limiting. Okay, eventually they're going to run out. Now when they run out, this is actually going to affect our population size. Meaning we reach what's called a carrying capacity. Now the carrying capacity is just that. It's the capacity that the environment can carry. Can't carry anymore. You can't have three billion barnacles on that rock. In fact, you probably can't have more than a couple hundred. That is the capacity for that rock. That's it. That ecosystem right there can only hold certain barnacles. So what's going to happen then again is you're going to reach a carrying capacity and the population growth is actually going to level off. And we're going to see this. In, actually, we're not going to see this. I'm going to draw this. That's what we're going to do. Okay. All right. So if we had unlimited resources, meaning we could just reproduce as much as we want, we have all of the food we need, all of the light we need, all of the space we need. If we have everything that we need, what's going to happen? This is going to be our population over here, and this is going to be time. Okay, population time. As time goes on, in the beginning, say we're a new population. We're barnacles that we just settled on that rock. In the beginning, growth is going to be very slow because we're a small population, right? Growth is very slow. And eventually, you can think of this as like doubling. One turns into two, two turns into four, four turns into eight, eight turns into 16, 16 turns into 32, then 64, then 100, and now you're jumping way up. You went from really, really small. Then we're gonna shoot up here. This is called exponential growth. Meaning you start off small and short, and then eventually you go up, 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 really quickly. Okay, this is again, you can kind of think of it as like doubling, this exponential growth. Now, in a perfect world, this would shoot boo, right off the board. Okay, but that's not a perfect world because there are limiting resources. Okay, so those limiting resources are going to cause the, the um, population to slow in its growth. Right now, we don't have all the food we need. We don't have all the space we need. In fact, now there's competition. Now they're kind of fighting over it. Now we can't get all the food and the resources that we need. That's a bad thing. That's going to decrease the amount of, you know, babies that you can have. Okay, and eventually you reach this right here, which is known as capacity. I can spell today. Okay, so we reach slow in the beginning. This quick up right here is known as the exponential part or the J part of the curve. And then it's going to slow down right here, and then finally it's going to just reach this plateau. This plateau is known as the carrying capacity. That is the maximum that the environment can carry of this species. Okay, because remember, we're just talking about a single population. Now, this doesn't just mean that nobody else can reproduce and nobody else is allowed to come in, but it just basically means for everyone that comes in or is everyone that is born, one dies. So the population kind of remains a net zero. Yes, of course, things are having babies, and yes, things are dying off but the kind of net kind of levels off at zero. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys.
All right, and that is, again, carrying capacity. All right, let's talk species interaction. This is my favorite. This is ecology, ecology. Not just population ecology. This is ecology. Now, when we're talking about competition, hopefully you guys kind of already got the gist of what competition is, but it's two organisms going after the same resource. Now, this can happen within species or between different species, but competition is competition, and usually in competition, it's a lose-lose for everybody. Yeah, okay, someone might win the food this time, but there's always going to be less food around. If you're competing over the same food source, there's always going to be less food around because you got some, they got some, maybe you won today, but they won yesterday. Again, always those numbers are going to be lower because everyone's going after the same resource. Predator-prey interactions are pretty self-explanatory. The predator eats the prey, right? So that interaction is usually a one-sided positive reaction. Yeah, the predator is going to be like, I love this interaction. The prey is like, I just got eaten. So not always good, but the prey doesn't always die. And we're going to talk about that as well. And finally, we have symbiosis, which basically means two organisms living together. Not always in a good way. You're like, wait, symbiosis, not always in a good way. And we're also going to talk about that. So let's get right to it. Talking about competition, again, the lose-lose scenario. Both organisms are fighting over the same resource. Now, if one organism, say we're two different species, if one organism is vastly superior than the other one, then he is going to be able to get all of the resources and that one is going to potentially wipe this guy completely out. This is what causes extinctions, okay? You have two organisms going after the same resource and one is just way better at it, the other one's never gonna even stand a chance and eventually you're probably gonna die off. Now sometimes they are able to adapt and evolve eventually and over time, switch food sources or whatever. In fact, we're gonna talk about resource partitioning which actually decreases the amount of competition between these organisms, creating more food for everybody. Now, the two types of competition that we're going to be talking about are intraspecific, and intraspecific is always within your own species. So intra, same species. Interspecific is in between two different species. Make sure you know the difference between those two. Even I get them mixed up sometimes because they sound so alike. I always think same species, intra, same, same, AA, I don't know. And inter, it's in between, right? Two different species. If you come up with it however you guys want to, but that's how I did it when I was in school. So whatever you guys do. Just remember that the, the poorer of the two competitions may die out. Now it might just be the population dies out, or it might actually be globally, the whole organism now goes extinct. And that's what we've learned, you know, long ago, some of these other organisms did not make it through time and therefore went extinct, probably because they were bad competitors and died out. All right. This right here, we can see a inter or intra-specific competition. Well, let me explain. Here we have these purple urchins right here, strongly ascentious purpuratus is a common purple sea urchin that we have off our coast. So they are competing with each other. This would be intra-specific, same, same, intra, same. <laughs> same, same. Now this guy is a red urchin and he is a different species of urchin. Yes, they're both urchins, but different species. So this would be interspecific. Inter, in between two different species. Hopefully guys, this kind of makes a little bit of sense to you. Um, like I said, as long as you can tell the difference between the two and can identify the two, that's great. However, you can kind of come up with it and do it. That's awesome. But that's how I did it. Okay, so it is actually both. Interspecific in between two species, intraspecific, in between the same species. Here we have two hermit crabs, interspecific or intraspecific? It's intraspecific because they're two of the same types of hermit crabs. We're actually going to see a really killer video of hermit crabs competing with each other. Um, in fact, I'm going to give you guys the link. I'm going to give you the, the link to that right now. Hang on for a second. Um, it is part of the BBC and they don't like me to put the, my videos, put their videos in my videos. So please go to the link. This test, this video will be on your test because it's an awesome video and you're going to see the coolest thing that hermit crabs do that you're like, wait, what? And they actually do this to avoid competition. So let's take a look. Hopefully you guys really love that video. I love this video. And remember, I just provided the link to you guys. I'll also put it up on Facebook or you can just Google BBC Hermit Crabs. 
trading shells. Anyway, how cool was that? They do it so they don't compete with each other, so they don't die. They know that any somebody could die and probably there's going to be a bunch of deaths. So instead of actually competing, they do this orderly fashion where they line up and they're like, I'm going to be gentlemanly and let you move into, sort of, except that big guy who just kind of like bullied the little guy out. Um, but again, this reduces the competition for shells because they know when two things compete, one of them loses. So take out the competition part and then everybody wins and gets the place to live. Yay. All right. Getting back to interspecific. So again, inter in between two different species. So this is what I was trying to say earlier that I couldn't find the words for. This is the principle of competitive exclusion. So essentially what happens is if one, if there are two species are going after the exact same resource and one is vastly superior and the other one can't adapt and change and go to a different resource, that's where you actually get that completely exclusion and the other one usually leads to extinction. So that is not the good thing. The other thing that happens is, okay, he's like, the, the lesser competitor is like, all right, well, I'm not as good as you at eating this stuff and you're way faster than me, so... I'm going to swap foods. So instead of me actually competing with you for that, I'm, I'm going to go get a different food. Or I'm going to eat the same food but at a different time. Or I'm going to eat the same food but in a different place than you. So you remove that direct competition from the equation and now everybody wins. And that is called resource partitioning. And we're going to get to that in just a second. But resource partitioning removes that competition and allows for more organisms to survive among each other. And that's that crazy ecology interaction that's really cool. It's like, how are all of these different species living in the same area, eating the same foods, but they're not competing with each other and they're not driving each other out or killing each other or driving one of them extinct. It's so cool. Okay. Anyway. All right. Let's get back to niches real quick because this is going to come up when we talk about resource partitioning. Remember your niche is where you live. Right? Your niche is where you live and what you need to survive and all that stuff. Like you need a shelter and you probably need some food and you probably need some water and you probably need some mates. So all these things are in your niche. Now in your niche, you also have what's called a fundamental niche, meaning these are all the, the places you could survive. You could survive anywhere from say California all the way down to Mexico. That's a big space, but in reality, you have a realized niche, and even though you could survive all the way from California down to Mexico, if in real life there's somebody else who's a better competitor than you in one of those areas, they're going to kick you out. And that's what's why it's called a realized niche, because realistically, you're not found all the way from California to Mexico. You're really just found, you know, in Moore Park or wherever. You know, your, your realized niche is always smaller because there is things like competition with other species. So for example, I worked on the juvenile giant sea bass. So the giant sea bass is this really, really big fish we have off our coast. It's like nine feet long, super huge. And it's like the ruler out here. Like he's the biggest bony fish that we have. And he's like swimming around. Well, the biggest reef fish that we have, the biggest bony reef fish that we have because the mullet is a little bit bigger. So he's swimming around and he's like, I'm the apex predator. I'm the top predator. Nobody eats me, la, 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 la. Well, he could survive all the way from Oregon down to the Gulf of Mexico. However, down in Mexico, there's what's called the Goliath grouper, a fish of similar size and stature and also an apex predator. Well, that Goliath grouper pushes out the giant sea bass. So the giant sea bass could live all the way down to, um, to the Gulf of Mexico, but doesn't because of that humble, the um, Goliath grouper. Okay. So that his fundamental niche is all the way, that whole huge west coast, but his realized niche is much smaller. He can't get into Mexico because the Goliath grouper kind of bullies him out. Okay, so that's the difference between the fundamental and the realized niche. Realized niche is always smaller, um, and it's due to some factor. It doesn't always have to do with the single species. Maybe the temperatures are just too cold. Yeah, I could live there, but I don't because I don't like it because it's too cold. Kind of thing like that. All right. Now we're getting into that thing called resource partitioning. So we have all these areas that you could live, but we've just heard there's competitions and sometimes somebody comes in and tries to bump you out. So what do we do? Well, what you do is you get a little creative and you start using whatever resource is limited in a very specific way. So resource partitioning is basically you partition out or separate out the resources so that everybody gets some. And this is why it's important. 
In this picture, we see the shore, right? This is the shore. We see this, the ocean right here, and we see the marshes right here with the fresh water, and the grass, and so we have the deeper water down here and the shallower waters up here. Well, look at how many birds are living in this area. Now, they're birds, okay? They all eat small fishes and insects and, well, I said bugs, and some plant matter and stuff like that. Okay, most of them, that's pretty much their general diet. But they're not all competing with each other because they're all using the same area slightly different. So let's start over here with the flamingo. Flamingo has very long legs and a very long neck. And his beak that he kind of snuffles around with in the dirt. He's like... Rrr, 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 rrr. So he's way out here in the deep water. None of these other birds are that tall and can get out there. So he's using this area right here that nobody else can. Alternatively, we have the diving birds. Okay, not a lot of birds can dive. The diving birds are like, I don't need long legs or a long neck to reach down there. I'm just going to go down there and swim and go catch it myself. Okay, so now even they're living, well, they're feeding in the same deeper waters, but they're doing it in a slightly different way. That's resource partitioning. If we come up here to the shore, right, we can see these little plovers who have very short little legs and a very short little beak, and they're really, really tiny, but they just run along the surface plucking up little tiny insects that are found right along the sand. Most of those insects are too small for any of these other birds to be sustained, but this guy's okay with it. This guy right here, we have a little dowager, and this dowager has a very long beak, and instead of plucking little insects off the surface, he's like, I'm gonna go way down and get some worms and stuff that are way down in here. Okay, so again, they're both feeding on the shore, on the sand, right at the surf line, but they're feeding on two different things. These guys are feeding in the same exact area, on the same things, but they're doing it in slightly different ways. Okay, so feeding in slightly different ways or slightly different times or on slightly different things now allows all of this diversity to come out. So we have so many more types of birds now because they're all eating in different ways or at different times or different things. So nobody's in direct competition with each other, which means there's nobody going to exclude one another, right? And now everybody gets to survive and everybody gets to thrive because of resource partitioning. Right? I know. Fascinating. Okay, let's talk symbiosis. So when we're talking about symbiosis, we're talking about two organisms living together. Now, it doesn't always have to be a good thing, but sometimes it is a good thing. So when we talk about facultative symbiosis, this basically means that you can live without the other. So think about the birds that eat little insects on the back of rhinos. Okay, they live together. That rhino's like, I'm just eating, this bird's just eating stuff off my back. Okay, so now, can the rhino live without the bird? Sure. Does the rhino benefit from the bird? Yeah, he's getting little bugs picked off of him. Does, can the bird live without the rhino? Absolutely. But does he benefit from living with the rhino? Yeah, he's getting food, and he's hitching around on a rhino. Win-win, right? Okay, so that's facultative, meaning you can facilitate our symbiosis as it works for both of us or maybe just one of us, or whatever. But we're facilitating, we can live without you. Now the other one is obligate symbiosis. And obligate symbiosis means you are obligated, meaning you must have them to survive. Okay, and in this case it would be something like a parasite. Right, yes, that parasite is living with the host. Yeah, the host doesn't want that parasite, but the parasite cannot live without the host. The host can live without the, the parasite, but the parasite can't live without the host. That would be the obligate symbiosis. Um, and again, the larger partner in the symbiotic relationship is always known as the host. So the rhino would be the host, and the bird would technically be the symbiote, the one who lives with the host. Um, yeah. Alright, so let's talk about a couple different types of symbiosis, and again, this is always some of my favorite stuff to talk about. So mutualism is where both species benefit. So that would be like the rhino. So let's go to the marine world, because this is marine biology, and let's talk about cleaner fish. So cleaner fish and cleaner shrimp do the, exactly that. They clean stuff and they clean other organisms. So what a fish will do, and it's crazy that they do this and they can't speak and they have very small brains, but they know how to do this because they know that this benefits both of them. Say a big grouper is going to come up and he is covered in parasites because he doesn't have any hands and he can't go like this and just pluck them off. So he's like, oh my God, I'm covered in these parasites, which is affecting my health. So he's going to come up to what's called a cleaning station where these cleaner wrasses are just waiting. Cleaner shrimp, cleaner wrasses, wrasses just type of fish. So they're just waiting. And then the fish comes up and it's like a car wash. 
and everybody rushes out and they start plucking off the parasites. Now the fish, the, the big one, the host, is like, cool, I'm getting these parasites removed from my face. And you'll actually see them flinch in these videos. They're like, ow, ow, ow. You'll see them flinch. In fact, Google it. Google cleaner shrimp and cleaner fish. It's like the coolest thing. Um, and so you'll see them like flinch and they don't even swim away because they know it's still good for them to get these parasites off of them. Meanwhile, the wrasses are like free lunch. Oh, and the cleaner shrimp, the cleaner shrimp are super cool. They will actually go into the mouths and the gills of fish and things like eels. And you'll see the eel with his big jaw. He's like, and he's like, he's got cleaner shrimp sitting right in his mouth and he doesn't eat him. He could eat him. Yeah, he could eat him and he could get a free meal. But it's better for him to get the parasites removed off of him and not to eat the cleaner wrasse. So it's like this mutualistic relationship, and that's exactly what it is. It's a mutualism. The cleaner wrasse gets food, the, the eel gets, you know, parasites removed off of him. It's a win-win. Everybody knows not to mess up the arrangement because it's a win-win for everybody. That's mutualism. Commensalism is next. Commensalism is where one organism benefits and the other one is completely unaffected. Now, there's always a this example of barnacles living on a whale and it's not exactly perfect but it's kind of the closest one that we have so you have a big blue whale and he's swimming around and he gets little barnacles like little acne right all over his face and you've probably seen it the barnacle needs a place to live the barnacle member needs that rock and therefore sometimes there's no rocks around but there is a whale so then you land on the whale and now that whale is your new rock so the whale is swimming around all day, every day, and the barnacle's like, yay, I get a free ride, and I filter feed, so look, I get all this water to filter feed, and therefore I get tons of food. So the barnacle's like, loving life, and the whale's like, are you even there? I don't even notice you. That's where it's like, asterisk, because the whale absolutely notices him, because imagine you literally have a face covered in rocks. It's going to be heavy, it's going to be itchy, it's going to cause drag. It does definitely affect that poor whale, but it's going to, it doesn't affect them much. It's certainly not going to kill the whale, right? So that's why we still use it as the commensalism relationship. One organism benefits, the other one's not affected. Parasitism is kind of an easy one. Again, we already talked about how the host gets infected by the parasite. Parasite feeds off of the host. Now, it's in the parasite's benefit not to kill the host because then you don't have a place to live and you could potentially die. Okay, so the host, the parasite never wants to kill the host. They just want to feed off of them, get their sustenance and their nutrients. So in this case, the parasite would benefit, but the host, that is, is negatively affected. Just like I told you, the fish covered in parasites is going to affect your health. So if you have a bunch of parasites, it does affect your health. health. So go see a cleaner ass. No, I'm kidding. That won't help for you. I mean, they do. Like, they are cleaner fish. If you go to, like, Thailand and stuff, you can put your feet in these baths. And they, like, pluck the dead skin cells off of your feet. It's, it's crazy. And it feels so weird. Um, but, yeah, it helps them out because they're getting food. Dead skin cells, guys. It's still food. All right, moving on. A uh, different type of symbiosis is the predation. Remember the predator-prey relationship we talked about? Now, there are a different, couple different types of this. Remember, the predator could just straight up eat the whole prey. That's one thing. Yes, that is definitely a predator-prey relationship. There's also another where the predator will actually eat part of the prey. Now, this is what happens with um, things like parrotfishes and angelfishes and coral. So the whole coral doesn't die, but polyps get removed. So you're eating kind of like, you're eating part of them, and they're staying alive. So like, this is my little polyp. It's like, okay, I ate that part. The rest of me is still alive, but you lost an arm. Okay, so again, still positive for the predator and negative for the prey, but they don't always die. Another type of um, predator-prey relationship is grazing. So if you're grazing, say you're a manatee and you're munching on seagrass, right? That seagrass is like, man, I just got eaten, but not all of me. The blades of me got eaten, but the roots of me did not get eaten, so now I can regrow. Okay, so it doesn't do the manatee any good to kill the whole freaking plant, right? We just want to eat part of it so we can come back and eat the rest of it later. And yeah, plants and allergies do send distress signals. Sorry, vegans. Um, okay, so those are our types of symbiosis. Now let's get into some ecosystem talk. So when we're talking about ecosystems, we're talking about all of the organisms that live in that area, as well as what's called abiotic factors. Excuse me. Abiotic factors are non-living factors. A means like non or not. Biotic is living. 
so not living factors. This would be things like temperature, rainfall, soil, um, soil composition, pH of the water, salinity of the water, all of those are non-living factors. So when you're talking about an ecosystem, you're talking about the interaction of the abiotic and biotic factors. So the non-living factors and the living factors. Living factors are usually competition and prey and mates sometimes. Who's, who are you eating? Who's eating you? And who are you mating with? So those are kind of like your living factors. If you get kicked off your rock because somebody else wants your rock, that's a living factor. Um, how hot that rock gets during the day, that's a non-living factor. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. All right, energy. Energy, like we've already talked about, is not created nor destroyed. It's just transferred. That's the law of conservation of energy. So when you're eating things, you're like, wait a minute, if I ate that cheeseburger and that cheeseburger had energy, how do I get the energy? And then where does it go? Doesn't it just stop with me? Doesn't all that energy just go to me and then just stop? No, because eventually you will die and that energy will then be released. But that's not the only place the energy goes. As you're eating that cheeseburger, you're actually releasing a lot of what's called metabolic heat. So that metabolic heat is that energy from the cheeseburger actually escaping through you. In fact, when we consume things, we're not very good at it. And I'm not just saying us, everything. When you consume something, you're really only getting about 10% of the nutrients that's actually found in that thing. What? Yes. We're going to see that in just a second. So what we're going to be talking about is that energy flow. So when we make these, um, we're going to be making these little ecosystem diagrams and stuff like that, always remember that the arrow is pointing towards where the energy is going. Okay, so if I'm pointing from somewhere to something, my energy is coming from here and coming, going from here and coming to me. Okay, so if the arrow points at me, it's coming from this source and it's going to me. So you can always think of any arrow that we see from the next little um, bit on that's going to be the energy flow that we're talking about. And specifically, we're talking about this in a food chain or a food web um, or even a food pyramid. So we're going to see all those right now. Let's talk about food chains first because they're the most simple. This is basically one thing eats another, eats another, eats another. The energy went from here to here to here to here. That's a food chain. You guys have all seen it before. Um, you know, the grass is, gets food energy from the sun, but the bunny eats the grass, but the hawk eats the bunny, that's how sun energy gets to the hawk. That's basically what's going on in a food web. Okay, so we have the primary producers. Remember, primary producers are the first producers. They're the ones creating the energy. Now, they don't create it. They're taking it from the sun and they're making it into usable energy that we can use. Okay, so primary producers in the marine environment are going to be your algaes and your plants. Um, so any of these, and your, you know, any kind of photosynthetic bacteria or microalgae, anything like that, anything that does photosynthesis is going to be a primary producer. So the primary producer has the energy, oh, see the arrow, it gets transferred to the primary consumer. So this is the phytoplankton. It gets eaten by the zooplankton, which gets eaten by the secondary consumers. Remember, all of these are consumers because nobody's producing. The only one who produces are these guys. So the primary producers get eaten by the primary consumers. Secondary, second level, eat the primary. Tertiary, eat the secondary. Quaternary, eat the tertiary. Okay, so this is the food chain. Now, is this the only thing that's happening in the environment? No! We're going to see that, and that's why food webs are so much better. But let's talk about the trophic pyramid real quick. So when we talk about the primary producer level to the secondary consumer level to the tertiary consumer level, in this case we're just going to stop at three to simplify stuff, the basal level right here is the largest, and that makes sense because these are the primary producers. Think about how many plants and algae and microscopic photosynthetic organisms are there. There's a ton. There's a ton. Okay, so that's where all that bulk of that energy is going to be, always in the bottom layer, that primary producer level. That's where all the energy is. Now, notice how it goes from 10,000 calories potentially available. Oh, no. When I move up to the next level, there's only... Sorry, 10 million. Now there's only a million. 10%. Only 10% of the available energy from the primary producers moves up one level. Now we move up a second level. 10%. Again, every level, you only get 10%. You lose 90% of the available energy. Every level you go up. So when we go from the phytoplankton to the krill, we go from 10 million to 1 million. When we go from the krill to the whale, we go from 1 million to 100,000. 
10%. So the calories available to the whale are only 100,000 out of 10 million possible. Okay, this is why these large organisms have to eat so much. We're only getting a fraction of that initial energy. Okay, so really, if this was 100%, this would be 10%. This would be 1%. He gets 1%. So when you go up two levels, it's like 10 times 10. What's 1%? That's just a So where does all that extra energy go? Well, like I said, a lot of it is lost as what's called heat energy. This is metabolic energy. As we're eating and we're moving around, we're burning that energy off so it's getting released into the environment, right? Back into the environment. As we die, yes, we all die, eventually we will get all of our energy transferred back to the decomposers. The decomposers help to feed the primary producers, right? That sun energy, that environmental energy will kind of get absorbed somewhere. Mostly it's traveling around our our solar system really but it, luckily for us it gets replaced every day by sun energy so really the initial source of energy on the planet is sun energy now this is if you're talking about primary producers photosynthetic primary producers wait till we get to hydrothermal vents and deep sea stuff because they don't need they don't need sun energy what yes all right remember how we talked about food webs are better than food chains here's why because that shark didn't just eat the tuna. He probably ate the tuna and the elephant and the, the mahi and the bird. He loved probably shark ate probably everything. And that's what's going on here in the food web. We actually see more interactions. So it's not one thing eats one thing eats one thing because that's not what really happens in nature. And really, you're eating anything you possibly can. So let's start with something simple. We have on the bottom right here, this is how you make a food web. You always put the primary producers on the bottom. And then you put your larger predators going at the very, very top. So we have things like the, zo the phytoplankton, which get eaten by the zooplankton. Now we have many different types of phytoplankton, but we also have many different types of zooplankton. So we have krill and copepods and amphipods. Those are all primary consumers. Now the secondary consumers would be things like small fishes and penguins and petrels, right? Technically, this guy is a secondary consumer because it's primary consumer, secondary consumer. So you don't have to think of how large they are to be like a secondary consumer. It's not really about that. It's how many steps they've gone into. Step one, step two, again, you've eaten once, you've eaten twice. So again, the arrow goes from here to here and here to here, transferring energy. If I have you guys draw a food web, which I will, make sure the arrow is pointing towards the mouth of whoever is eating. Otherwise, you would basically say the baleen whale gets eaten by the krill, and that does not make any sense. <laughs> Swap it. The krill gets eaten by the baleen whale. So that's how I always say the arrows. This one gets eaten by that one. Okay? So and that's why you can see right here, it is a web. It is a complex web of intertwining organisms. Because the petrel is not just eating small fishes. He's also eating amphipods and copepods and krills. Right? That leopard seal isn't just eating emperor penguins. He's also eating small fishes and penguins and these crab eater seals. And this killer whale is not just eating one thing. He's basically eating everything. Okay, so it's very complex and that's why food webs are always more accurate because it's really more of a representation of what's going on in the environment. Nobody eats just one thing. Everybody's just opportunistic. They're eating whatever they can. Okay, let's talk about some major marine environments for a second. Since we are talking about ecology, let's talk about where we are in the ecosystem. So if we're talking about a benthic organism, and again, these terms are going to come up, especially when we start to talk about phylums in a couple weeks. Ooh, next week, I think. Um, anything benthic is going to live on or near the bottom. So if I'm a benthic organism, say I'm a flatfish, right, or stingray, I sit on the bottom. I'm a barnacle, I'm stuck to the bottom. I am benthic. Uh, I'm a clam, I live in the bottom. I am benthic. Okay, all of those, again, are going to be considered benthic because they live on or near the bottom. Now we're going to define some more classic terms of what it actually means you're inside the dirt that's actually in faunal, but we're not there yet. We're going to get there. Now, typically when we're talking about the marine environment, we're talking either that you are in the intertidal zone, meaning the area in between tides. Highest high tide, lowest low tide. So when the tide goes up, you're all covered. When the tide goes back, you're all exposed. This area is known as the intertidal zone, in between the tides. Okay, if you're talking subtidal, that is lower than the lowest low tide, meaning you are always submerged. So like 99.9% .9 of the ocean is subtidal. Okay, because just think along the coast, that's the only part that's intertidal. 
Okay. So let's talk about our subtitle zones. So these are all considered subtitles, but let's get a little bit more specific. Do you need to know this chart? Yes. Do you need to be able to maybe draw and identify this chart? Yes. Okay. So we have the epipelagic up here. This is that upper 200 meters right here. Now I will tell you, you do not need to know the actual depths. You need to know the order. You do not need to know the numbers of the depths. If you don't get that it's 1,000 to 4,000, don't worry about it, okay? Just know the order. Epi means above, so that's on the top layer. So that epipelagic zone would be out here. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Pelagic means above the open ocean, okay? So anything away from the shore, that's pelagic, okay? Remember how we learned about the continental shelf and the continental break and all that? Remember, I told you it's going to come back. Okay, so this is the continent. This is the continental shelf. Okay, so the epipelagic is on the continental shelf. Remember how I told you that it kind of like nice, steady, narrow, steep, and then it drops off? That shallow area where bulk of that life is, that's all epipelagic. It's still open water column, but it's only from 0 to 200 meters. It's not that deep. And again, this is where the bulk of the life is. That area above the continental shelf is known as the neuritic zone. Okay, so anything above the continental shelf, the area of the continental shelf is known as the neuritic zone. Now, once you move past the continental shelf, now you're considered the oceanic zone. That's the deep open ocean, right? Neuritic means near the continent, oceanic, not near the continent, just deep ocean. So again, we have the top part, that's the epipelagic. Below that, we have the mesopelagic or the middle pelagic. Below that, we have the bathy pelagic, the low, dark, deep stuff. And finally, you're going to get into the abyssal pelagic or the abyss. Like that movie where they're sunken down so deep into the ocean, into the abyss. Right? The very, very bottom part. Now, there is one more. It's called hadopelagic or just the hodl zone. It's H-A-D-A-L. And that, it would be like submarine trenches. So like the Marianas Trench isn't considered abyssal. It's even deeper than the bottom of the ocean. It's haddle or hoddle. Same kind of thing. That's very, very deep. That's in the canyon right here. All right. So yes, you guys need to know these. Don't worry about the actual depths, just the order of them. Um, so we talked about this. In the epipelagic zone, there's going to be a ton of light. It's only 0 to 200 meters. You have light. You will have photosynthesis in the whole thing. That's where the bulk of the life is. That's over the continental shelf. That's where a lot of diversity is happening in this epipelagic zone. Once you get down to the mesopelagic, however, it gets dark, which means you're going to have very little light. This is known as the twilight zone. Sometimes it's a little bit lighter because you're not that far away from the sun. Sometimes it's a little bit darker. Okay, That's that middle pelagic zone, that mesopelagic zone known as the twilight zone. There is some light. Not really enough for photosynthesis, at least not efficient photosynthesis. But you can see just a little bit. Now once you get down to the bathy pelagic and anything below that, dark, dark, nothing, no light, absolutely no light penetrates there. So that is just pure darkness at that point. Anything below bathy pelagic. So what kind of organisms live in these areas, you might ask? Well, up here in the epipelagic, like I said, that's going to be the most diverse of all of them. Because you have organisms that live in the intertidal zone. You have organisms that live on that neuritic zone, that continental shelf as well as all of your photosynthetic organisms that are going to be floating around the surface, as well as any of the organisms that might rely on those photosynthetic organisms floating around the surface. So if you are, say, a shark or a dolphin or one of these guys that might eat these smaller fishes that are eating the photosynthetic organisms, you want to be where the food is. You want to be on that top layer. Now, once you start to get lower, this is where you actually have to be a little bit more adapted to said environment because, like I said, it's dark. There's not a lot of primary productivity which means you got to find your nutrients somewhere. So these guys out here in the mesopelagic zone, these are the very specialized hunters. Those deep sea divers, they do what's called vertical migration. Sometimes they go lower, sometimes they go higher. But found here, not a ton of diversity. We move here, bathypelagic zone, basically the same thing. All of these different fishes are very specialized to live in this area, but they all kind of look the same. They're going to have that same kind of adaptations because they live in the same really rough environment. Now, when you get down to the abyssal pelagic zone, the hadopelagic zone, this is where things really start to get weird. Because once you hit the bottom, diversity actually goes back up, which is crazy. Um, so you'll start to get a whole different slew of organisms that live way, way down here. And I can tell you guys, this is, a, this is that anglerfish, the one in Nemo with the little glowing esca. And the big, scary teeth that everyone's like, oh my god, I don't want to go into the ocean because there's things like that. 
Let me just tell you, the average angler and hatchet fish with the big jaw with this, like this big. Like, there's nothing to worry about. Unless you're Nemo and are that big, you're fine. You're fine. Like everything pretty much here in the bathy of Basil is actually pretty small. There's not a lot of food out there. And we're going to talk about all about that when we get to the deep sea lectures. Really cool stuff, guys. All right. Let's get back to the surface. Let's get back to that epipelagic zone because we need to do some primary productivity. So when we're doing primary productivity, remember primary means first and productivity means you're producing that usable energy. Now you're not creating the energy, you're just taking sunlight, you're doing photosynthesis, but now you've made glucose, that is sugar, that is energy. And now we need to transfer that set energy. So when you're first doing photosynthesis and you have the bulk of everything that's usable, that's known as the gross primary production or primary productivity. That's the total amount that's actually there. Now, of course, just like your paycheck, you never get the gross amount, which kind of sucks. You get the net amount. So it's whatever they've reduced off of it. So pulled off of it. The gross is always bigger than the net. The net primary productivity is kind of like what's available as usable bits of energy. Not the total sum that might be there if everything was in an ideal world, but actually what's there and what can actually be used. Um, so this is what actually is going to form that base of the, the um, food pyramid the trophic pyramid. Um, it's going to be just the net primary production because that's the only usable bits of energy that are there. And there's whole different reasons for that, which we're going to talk about later on in the semester. Now, when we're talking about phytoplankton, this is kind of the bulk of what does photosynthesis in the ocean. So you think, yeah, trees are super important and they really, really are. But what's really producing all of our oxygen? Algaes. Right? Algae's in these micro phytoplankton organisms that are basically little floating plants that are doing plants that are doing photosynthesis. So this is the bulk of that energy that we get and our oxygen. Thank you very much. So this this total amount of phytoplankton that is possibly producing this primary production is known as a standing stock. Okay, how much is there in the water column? So usually we measure out a particular size and then we just say Okay, what is my standing stock in that water column, in that unit of water? And that's what we can see right here. Okay, so this would be a standard. We'd measure out a specific area and say, okay, my standing stock would be the amount of phytoplankton that I have and the possible organisms that can do photosynthesis. So that's all you can see right here. And usually it's like one square meter. So it's like square by square by however deep the water is. Now, are you guys going to have to calculate that? No. Should you kind of know what it is and how we measure it? Sure, absolutely. Now remember that uh, oxygen is super important to us because we need it to survive. Weird. And oxygen is coming from organisms that do photosynthesis. So when there is light available, you can see photosynthesis occurs, which produces organic matter, which then gets turned via animals, via cellular respiration, into CO2, and back and forth. So we have this nice balanced ecosystem, and not just animals, plants do cellular respiration, remember that. Um, so not only do we get O2 that's produced from photosynthesis, but we also get O2 that's used up in cellular respiration. So you're kind of producing it and using it up all at the same time. Same thing with the CO2. You're producing it, but you're using it. You're producing it, but you're using it. So your net is kind of zero. And this is when there is sunlight. Now when there's not sunlight, you can't do photosynthesis. So in this case, you only have respiration happening, which just means the O2 is just being sucked up out of the water. So it's always really important to have this primary production level because every living animal in the ocean needs oxygen. If you're an animal, you need oxygen because you're going to go through cellular respiration, so you have to have oxygen to do it. Where they're getting the bulk of their oxygen? Well, from those primary producers as well as, you know, the actual air. But that oxygen in the air is also coming from the primary producers, so really it's all about the primary producers providing us everything that we need to survive. Now there's a couple different cycles that happen, not just that oxygen cycle, that gas cycle that you, we just saw, but also what's called nutrient cycles. So the first nutrient that we're going to be talking about is carbon, and carbon's super important because we need carbon. Plants also need carbon. Remember that CO2? Yeah, it starts with carbon. Luckily we produce it for them, but that's not the only source of where they're actually getting it from. It does cycle through the environment because just like energy, it's not created nor destroyed. It's just transferred. Okay, so we have CO2 that's out in the atmosphere. It's going to get dissolved into water. That's one source of dissolved CO2. We have the organisms that are actually doing cellular respiration. That's another source of the CO2. 
And that includes plants, because plants do cellular respiration. Okay, so that's all adding to the dissolved CO2. Now, who's taking it out? The primary producers are taking it out. So that's that little green arrow going the opposite way. They're taking it out. Okay, so essentially, this is basically just showing you how, ox how CO2 kind of comes in, and it gets stored, but then it gets taken up. Then as these plants die, it gets put back into the environment. As these plants get eaten, it gets put back into the environment. As these guys die, it gets put back in the environment, which then gets absorbed by these guys, which then gets put back in the environment, which then gets absorbed. So you can see why it's very much a cycle. Because they do get transferred and transferred and transferred and transferred. The, all of these interactions. Okay, so it's not just, oh, I ate you. It's, I ate you, but I transferred nutrients. And I got your nutrients. And when I die, I'm going to transfer them back to the plants, etc. Okay, so it is always these cycles. And it's not just carbon. Nitrogen and phosphorus are also two elements that are very, very important and therefore also get cycled. Okay, so let's see how nitrogen gets cycled first. So yes, there is nitrogen and nitrates in the air that does get dissolved into the water. That's one source of them. Another one is going to be these rivers. So there's actually nitrates and ammonias, which are the basis of nitrites, uh, which are going to be pumped out into the ocean via these rivers and these off, uh, just as like runoffs. Now we also have some nitrogen fixing bacteria little tiny bacteria that actually take unusable bits of atmospheric nitrogen and go and now it's usable for plants and animals and everybody else who needs it including us thank you bacteria so these are all the reasons that we actually get these fixed nitrogen into our um, oceans and again the plants and the algae are going to absorb it because they need those minerals and those nutrients then they're going to die and they're going to put it back in the ecosystem then they're going to absorb it then other organisms are going to eat them which is going to put it back into these when they're going to die that's also going to put it back in so all these things are happening again all of the time to replenish these nutrients these elements these naturally occurring things that are in the ocean and that are absolutely essential for life and essential essential for life i was going to say necessary and essential it came out essential now, here's phosphate, same kind of thing. We're coming from the rivers, we're coming from some runoff, we're also coming from the atmosphere. We're also gonna get absorbed by the algaes, and then when the algaes die, they're gonna get put back into the ecosystem, which are gonna get absorbed again, which are gonna get, are you seeing the pattern here? It's just kind of, again, these repetitive cycles of these nutrients being recycled in our environment, which is great because everybody needs them, and therefore they never run out because we always have them, because they are. Recycling, guys, it's not just for your garbage. It's also for your atmosphere. All right. Now, because all these things do get recycled and there is an interaction, meaning the plants are going to absorb something which are going to get eaten by the smaller fishes, which are going to get eaten by the larger fishes, which are going to get eaten by the largest fishes, right? There is unfortunately something that happens called bioaccumulation. Now, as these things get transferred and transferred and transferred, sometimes they can't exactly get broken down. And this is kind of what we're talking about when we talk about bioaccumulation. So say we have a plastic problem, which we do, or a pollution problem, which we do. Say that pollution gets absorbed into the plants, which then gets eaten by the smaller fish, which then gets eaten by the larger fish, which then gets eaten by the largest fish. Okay? If the plant couldn't get rid of it, and the smaller fish couldn't get rid of it, and the medium fish couldn't get rid of it, every single time it gets passed up, it accumulates. Which means that large organism, who has now eaten lots of the smaller fishes, who has eaten lots of the smaller fishes, who have eaten even more of the algae, all of these are bioaccumulated. And this is actually going to be a homework assignment that I'm going to give you guys. I'm going to remember to put this, I'm going to write myself a note right now. Give you guys homework. It's really quick and super simple. Bio, where are we? Marine bio. <laughs> Uh, but it's actually going to have you guys calculate bioaccumulation and, and reasons why you're not supposed to eat things like shellfish in certain months of the year. It's not because the shellfish aren't good. It's because the shellfish have eaten something that had toxins in it and they bioaccumulate. So if you eat enough oysters, you will also bioaccumulate all of those toxins and that could kill you. Most of the time it just causes like toxic shock syndrome and, and brain disorders which you don't want. So again, don't do it. So things like heavy metals, non-biodegradable pesticides, natural toxins, plastics, you know, they get into our system and we can't get rid of them. When we get eaten and things get eaten, they bioaccumulate. Um, and one really, really sad thing is called this biomagnification. And that occurs in things like sharks. Um, so these toxins and these pesticides and these stuff that these little fishes are eating in small amounts, not necessarily killing them, but the larger fishes eat a lot more, the little fishes. 
And then the larger sharks and stuff eat those fishes, and therefore every level, this biomagnification, this bioaccumulation build up and build up and build up. Now when we get to some of these sharks, these sharks have no way of getting rid of them. So unfortunately what these sharks do sometimes is they off them to their offspring. So they're like, man, I am full of these like toxins and these poisons. Um, and I'm also pregnant. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pass them to my offspring, which means the offspring are probably not going to survive because they're full of toxins. Meanwhile, the shark is like, okay, I feel so much better, but he's going to go back and he's going to eat more of those toxic fish. So he's going to do this again. So every litter he puffs or she puffs, every litter she puffs is going to have these toxins in it, which means the shark population is going to. So the top predators, those larger predators, they're going to have that biomagnification and they're going to be the ones that really suffer. And that's really a sad thing. And we're going to talk about a lot of depressing things in the future, unfortunately, um, because plastics is, it's a huge problem. Toxins, pesticides, pollution. It's all a huge problem, not for the little guys, for the bigger ones, including us. In fact, there was just a study done. They're pulling plastic out of human tissue. That means your cells have plastic in them because you've eaten so many organisms with plastics in them. We have now biomagnified our concentrations of plastic. And guess what? Those plastics aren't going anywhere. They're going to stay inside your body forever. This is a problem. This is why we have to recycle. This is why we have to reduce our plastic usage. And this is exactly why I have, as extra credit, a beach slash park slash whatever cleanup because plastics are a big problem. And if you don't think so, go check your cells out. There's plastic in it. Of course, you can't do that. But scientists have already done that. They're now saying that every living thing on the planet has some kind of plastic in it. That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. Anyway, I digress. <gasps> And with that, another terrible dad joke for you guys. So this guy says, and now as a token of my appreciation for the vital role your species plays in the food chain, I'm going to eat you. And with that, I'm going to go have some dinner. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it, guys. Your test is coming up. Remember, it is on the first few lectures, um, including up through marine ecology. So go study for your test. We're going to start phylums right after this. Guys, it's going to be so much fun. We're getting into each and every one of the animal phylums, and it's going to be so cool. I can't wait. Have a great night.